Russia, and uh, thanks to you and all the other organizers for inviting me to speak at this conference. Um, it's a pleasure to be back here in Santa Barbara. So um, the context of my talk today will be an attempt to describe a holographic principle for asymptotically flat spacetimes, and more precisely, a program that's now known under the name of celestial holography. And what's been really exciting in the past uh, couple of years, and uh, um, in particular past couple of months, is there are more and stronger connections with other subfields in the high energy community that are forming and which inform uh, the discussion and, and push us forward in this quest. And I will get back to that towards the end of the talk. Now let me define the context of the talk, which is celestial holography, which um, suggests that quantum gravity in deep less two-dimensional asymptotically flat spacetimes um, has a dual description in terms of a theory that lives on the co-dimension two sphere at the boundary of the spacetime, and we will refer to this theory as celestial conformal field theory. Now, the reason why such a co-dimension two proposal has any reason to um, be put forward is that the Lorentz group in d plus two dimensions acts as the Euclidean global conformal group in d dimensions, and we would like to exploit these properties of this conformal symmetry as much as we can to make headway uh, in this undertaking. Um, the first hint that such a proposal could uh, succeed is that the S matrix, when put in a basis that makes the symmetry manifest, takes the form of a correlation function on this d-dimensional sphere. And we want to exploit the consequences of that. So in a little bit more detail, um, what's going on is that if you put the S matrix in this uh, so-called boost basis, then we get a correlation function on the celestial sphere, and we can think of it as inserting operators at points on a celestial sphere, and these operators carry as the labels the quantum numbers under the global conformal group. So that's the conformal dimension delta and the spin L. And we can get these um, d-dimensional boundary operators directly from d plus two-dimensional bulk operators by a, some sort of uh, extrapolate dictionary, where we take a large R expansion of these bulk operators and then perform um, this uh, particular uh, light ray integral on the boundary where this parameter u here is the null time on one of these uh, null boundaries of asymptotically flat space. And performing this uh, integral transform essentially trades um, two, one variable for another, which is the null time, for this um, parameter, the conformal dimension delta. Now, there are two limits that have been particularly useful in trying to push forward this program. One we heard already about by Natalie on Monday, namely collinear limits which uh, in this boost spaces take the form of a uh, celestial operator product expansion. So if you take two particles collinear, this becomes on the celestial sphere, um, essentially the OPE, where you take these two operators close. There's another limit which is very important and which will uh, be much discussed in the course of this talk, which is that of um, energetically soft limits. So in quantum field theory, we have these universal factorization properties of scattering amplitudes that arise when you take the energy of an external mass as particle to zero, if a factorization of the amplitude into a lower point amplitude times uh, something, uh, and that something starts with a pole in the energy. Um, and in fact, we have a, a dot, dot, dot here, so there's an expansion in one over the energy. And what this means in this boost basis is that this energetically soft expansion gets mapped to another limit. Now, since we have uh, traded um, the basis of energies or um, the, the basis of uh, positions, for a basis where we have uh, manifest Lorentz symmetry, um, we obtain a new limit by doing um, a so-called Mellon transform, which integrates over all the energies and introduces this parameter delta, the conformal dimension. So th these are two dual variables similar to U and delta. So we have omega and delta, and we map um, the terms in the energetically soft expansion to um, poles in this uh, celestial correlation functions that arise at discrete values of the conformal dimension. So there are these two universal pro uh, processes, one in an energy eigenbasis and one in a boost eigenbasis that map in this way uh, into each other. Now, um, to, in response to the question from Monday, uh, I thought I'd belabor this point a little bit more, um, which, which is that if we start with a basis of energy eigenstates, which is what we usually do in quantum field theory, um, we can map to basis of boost eigenstates by this Mellon uh, transform integrating over the energies. And what this does is it makes the uh, manifest, it, it obscures the manifest translation symmetry in the energy basis 
and traits is manifest Lorentz symmetry in the boost basis. Um, this happens at the price of um, transforming uh, translations into weight shifting operators in this uh, putative dual theory, um, which takes the conformal dimension and shifts it. Now, if we start with finite energy eigenstates, what this transform maps to is to eigenstates uh, under a conform global conformal group, which is restricted to have the conformal dimensions on the principal continuous series. The energetically soft limit, on the other hand, so the different terms in the low energy expansion get mapped to a discrete series, a semi-infinite power of discrete values of the conformal dimension. And uh, we'll be focusing uh, in the first part of this talk on this uh, limit. So what we have is the S matrix in this boost basis. I'd let me be a bit more explicit. So usually we put in um, plane waves as asymptotic states. Let's say we focus on a massless scalar plane wave where the momentum is um, parameterized in terms of an energy omega and another vector q, which points towards the celestial sphere. The Mellon transform then takes it to a new wave function, uh, which has this explicit form. And you can check that this new wave function um, transforms under the global conformer group as a conformal primary. So you trade the basis of plane waves for a basis of conformal primary wave functions. And in that way, you get a correlation function on the celestial sphere um, that carries the labels conformal dimensions and spin under the global conformal group. Now, this is a correlation function in the so-called celestial conformal field theory. But this is not a garden variety CFD. And let me emphasize two, uh, two uh, features of uh, this uh, putative uh, celestial conformal field theory that are very unfamiliar from a usual CFD perspective. The first is that because you integrate uh, over energies, there's no longer Wilsonian decoupling. And that means that celestial amplitudes are only well-behaved if the corresponding momentum space amplitude has a sufficiently well-behaved UV. So this is the case for string theory, but for Einstein gravity, for example, these amplitudes are not well-behaved. And I will get back to that point uh, towards the end. Um, there's another feature that's rather uh, strange, which is that these wave functions have distributional support. On the, on the celestial sphere. And that just comes from the fact that we have uh, energy momentum conservation in the bulk. And so if you look at low point correlators, um, you will have some remnant of these delta functions flying around. Um, one thing that we will see in the second part of the talk is that if you compute celestial amplitudes not in flat space, which is uh, where these features become apparent, but on certain backgrounds, then they are much nicer behaved. Okay, so these are two features to keep in mind. Um, so now let me tell you what the plan of the talk is. So there are two questions that I want to address. The first is, in any construction of a celestial dual pair, um, the important first step is to identify the symmetries. A good place to start is by looking at the infrared properties of gauge theory and gravity, because they often give universal uh, behavior, and universality often has to do with symmetry. Um, and indeed, the soft theorems that I just uh, this described, um, they have been shown to be related to asymptotic symmetries, of the asymptotically flat space-time. But what's particularly nice about this boost basis is that it makes this connection between um, soft physics and symmetries very manifest. So this is, in a sense, the right basis to try to uh, answer the question of what are all the symmetries. Or at least that's what I would like to put forward. Um, the second question it has to do with the fact that, okay, now if we understand the symmetries on both sides, um, what can we do with it? And what kind of tests has this holographic proposal uh, to pass? And a litmus test, really, for celestial holography would be if it can account for non perturbative physics, such as the formation and the evaporation of black holes. That's very hard, and that's not what I'm going to describe today. But instead, I will take sort of a step towards uh, this direction and ask, what are the imprint of bulk geometries on states in this putative celestial conformal field theory? Uh, and in particular, how do uh, they uh, leave an imprint in correlation functions? And uh, in these two uh, questions here, um, ha I had the fortune of working with amazing collaborators. So on this first question about symmetries, um, this project is with my student, Giorgio Bano, and my postdoc, Emilio Trevisani, in a work that's about to appear in the next couple of days. And the second part uh, has been done in work in collaboration with uh, Ricardo Gonzo, who is a postdoc in Edinburgh, and Tristan McLaughlin, who is in Dublin. Okay. So let me start with uh, the topic of symmetries in celestial conformal field theory. <clears throat> 
So let me start with quantum field theory, and let's remember some elementary uh, facts, which is that in quantum field theory, conservation equations for operators define symmetries. We can then construct delta currents by contracting these operators with some parameters. Um, the conservation uh, for the delta currents imposes a condition on these parameters, and we can then go and construct conserved charges, which are given by topological surface operators um, that integrate the delta current on some region. Uh, on your GFT space. And they practically act by um, taking variations of the operators that are enclosed in this region. So now the task for um, celestial conformal field theory and trying to understand what all the symmetries is to identify what these operators are. Okay, so let's do that. So the strategy will be to start from soft theorems, put them in this new boost basis, the spaces of conformal primaries, and there, we'll see that they give rise to what identities for special operators, and we're gonna uh, classify um, these operators. So operators are protected if there exists a shortening condition of their conformal multiplets. Um, so that means that a primary operator must have a descendant, which is also a primary. And luckily, this was already classified, the cases when this happens in general CFD, by Joao and collaborators. And we're gonna use this classification to identify all the soft symmetries in uh, CCFD and build the primary descendants and the associated um, charges for these conformally soft operators. So in two dimensions, we've done this a few years ago um, together with Emilio and Sabrina Posterski, and then in this upcoming work, we extend this to any, any dimension. Okay, so let me start in two dimensions. So. In two dimensions, in two-dimensional CFTs, um, we have global primary descendants, so descendants of primaries that become primaries themselves, um, which come in three types um, that depend on whether the spin of the descendant is bigger, smaller, or equal to the spin of the parent primary. We can then go and identify what the conservation equation is for these uh, primary operators that have primary descendants. And in 2D CFT, we have essentially holomorphic and anti-holomorphic derivatives and so this will be some uh, equation that has a bunch of, of these derivatives. And the number of these derivatives, in general, there can be a higher number of derivatives, depends on the type of primary descendants. And these are the typical uh, conformal multiplets that arise in a two-dimensional um, celestial conformal field theory, where the different types of uh, primary descendant operators appear. So from the soft theorem, we will uh, know what the conformal dimension of the special operator is. Then we use conformal representation theory to determine um, how, what the degree of conservedness is, essentially reading off um, these exponents of the derivatives here, and then construct note the currents and charges. So let me um, just explain this for the easiest example, which is the leading soft photon theorem. If you put that Weinberg soft theorem in the conformal basis, um, essentially, if you want to read off the one over energy um, pole term, um, this is what you get. And if you look at this, you see that this, is a, this looks like a correlation function for a U1 current. So the current here is this expression on the left-hand side. We have multiplied by delta minus one because the one over omega pole corresponds to the pole at delta equals one. And so this is how, how you get this operator um, that's, whose insertion gives something finite on the right-hand side. Okay, so this current is conserved, and we can construct another current by multiplying with some parameter. The parameter has to be holomorphic if you want the another current to be conserved. And we can then construct uh, a conserved charge by integrating the another current over a region, which is just a contour in two dimensions. And in this way, we get uh, a tower of charges um, from the, this uh, leading soft photon theorem. And when this uh, parameter epsilon here uh, this function is not a constant, then what this corresponds to from the space-time point of view is large gauge transformations. Now we can go on and look at gravity. So the, we have a soft graviton theorem. This is the Weinberg soft pole, but then we also have an order one term in terms of the energy, which gives us the subleading soft graviton theorem. And we can do the same thing. We find that there is a conservation equation for these two um, operators, one at dimension one and the other at dimension zero. And they have different uh, degrees of conservedness, which gives a different uh, number of towers of charges. 
Now, uh, here we have dimension one and dimension zero, but in 2D CFD, we also expect an operator of dimension two, the stress tensor. How does that come about? Well, actually, this operator here that has um, a conservation equation of degree three is actually the shadow transform of the two-dimensional stress tensor. And then once you have um, understood this, uh, you can re you realize that these uh, soft theorems actually correspond uh, in the space-time picture to um, the by now famous uh, BMS super translations and super rotations. So these were the leadings of photon, leading and subleadings of graviton. They fall into this uh, type two category um, of primary descendant classification. We can go to more subleading orders in the energetically soft expansion and find uh, the type three operators. And then there's some semi-infinite tower of, of more subleading terms, which are of type one. Now, the interesting thing that happened in the last uh, few years is, um, or two years ago, is that um, these operators that start with dimension one, zero, minus one, et cetera, they actually form an algebra. And this is uh, very uh, curious that uh, the same infinite tower of conformally soft operators um, organizes itself in a very nice way. Um, and much work has been done in, in recent years, and including um, the twisted community that has entered the field. And there are many open questions associated with that. Okay, so so much about two dimensions. Now let me go to high dimensions. And uh, I don't have to explain to this audience that everything is much more complicated in high dimensions. Um, there are more types of primary descendants that you get. Um, they depend on whether you are in even dimensions or odd. Um, spin is more complicated in high dimensions. And in particular, if you want to capture all the soft theorems, then you have to go beyond the traceless and symmetric representation. And you have to also do a refinement of the different types of primary descendants because uh, spin is no longer labeled by just one number. And the conformal multiplets take a much more uh, richer or much more complicated structure than in two dimensions. And another important point is um, that while in two dimensions we still got the conserved current, um, in high dimensions we get no non-trivial charges if you don't use the shadow transform. So the shadow transform is uh, an integral transform in, in CFD that takes an operator of dimension delta to an operator of dimension d minus delta. And what comes about here is that unless you apply the shadow transform, you will not find the usual familiar um, conserved operators in high dimensions. And what's puzzling is that we don't understand from the bulk perspective why you should do this. You have quantum field theory soft theorems, and now um, somebody comes and tells you that uh, you need to do this CFD transform in order to find uh, a good interpretation of uh, the symmetries associated with it. So that's an interesting open question. Um, so let me just give you the result, um, which is that for the leadings of photon and graviton theorem and the subleadings of graviton theorem, um, the, if you take the soft theorems into the conformal basis, the water, identity does, water identities that you will land on uh, have, diff, have certain um, primary descendants of type uh, one or one two in this, refined, um, in this refinement. And these give rise to trivial charges. So now we take a shadow transform and then lo and behold, what we find is the uh, conserved operators corresponding to current stress tensor and this weight shifting operator, which has to do with um, d plus two dimensional translations. Okay. Um, and an interesting side note is that um, there's a way to understand one of those primary descendant operators in this classification um, as having the same action as the shadow transform. So that's also a curious feature. Um, there's a couple of open questions, which is that uh, now we landed on these essentially global symmetries in high dimensions, which is what you expect from a CFD perspective. Um, but there's also proposals for high dimensional generalization of the BMS group. And the question is, uh, how do they fit into this picture? And there's a bunch of other questions which uh, I might get back to later. Okay, so so much about symmetries. We have now uh, classified um, symmetry, so symmetries in two-dimensional celestial CFDs and um, extended this to higher dimensions. Now let me talk about backgrounds. So we would like to um, characterize backgrounds that have non-zero mass or charge purely from the boundary perspective. So that includes black holes, gravitational waves, uh, matter, whatnot. Um, and the two questions that I would like to address is, how do certain bulk geometries uh, arise as operators acting on the vacuum state from this um, putative um, 
dual theory that lives on the celestial sphere of the boundary. And the second question that I want to ask is, background spray isometries, so what does this mean for these uh, celestial conformal correlation functions? And I will make use of old and new results that uh, relate classical backgrounds to, um, to scattering amplitudes and uh, in particular uses uh, new insights from the amplitudes community. Okay, so first off, uh, some old results uh, dating back to the late 60s, um, where Bulwer and Brown um, found that the classical field that's produced by a source is the generating functional for uh, the tree graph approximation through a corresponding quantum field theory. So if we start with the generating functional for connected correlators, then the classical limit um, is uh, determined by the classical solutions of the equations of motion, and there's a relation between the classical solution and this generating functional that's given by taking a functional derivative with respect to the source. Now having that, we can then go about and compute endpoint correlators by taking n minus one such derivatives uh, on the classical solution. So what we wanna do now is if we wanna compute amplitudes on backgrounds, we just go ahead uh, and compute the classical solutions to the equations of motions in the presence of a source. And then we have this formula here that tells us how to compute endpoint amplitudes. So we are interested in particle-like backgrounds. So what are those? So um, particle-like backgrounds are backgrounds that can be generated by um, classical three-point functions or three-point amplitudes with an off-shell coherent emission of a messenger, like a photon or a graviton. So this is a very intuitive sense in which uh, this is a background that has a particle-like interpretation. And this includes um, the Coulomb field of a static or spinning point charge. It includes Schwarzschild curve, and also there are ultra boost limits, which includes in particular the Eichelberg sexual metric. And all of these um, take the form of what's called Kerr shield backgrounds. So these are backgrounds that have very nice properties. Um, we can write the gauge field and the metric in terms of um, these vectors K, which are called Kerr shield vectors, and they have the property that they are null and geodesic with respect to both the flat metric and uh, the full metric in the case of gravity. Um, which is um, taking the flat metric plus this sort of Kerr shield uh, metric piece. And then there's this function V, this scalar function, which solves the free wave equation. And as a side note to highlight, this is not the linearization, it's really exact solution uh, to the equations of motion. So for example, we're interested in scattering scalars of non-trivial backgrounds. Um, for this, we compute, uh, say, the wave equation for a complex scalar that's minimally coupled to gravity in the presence of a source. We solve um, for um, the field perturbatively in the coupling G, and then we plug it into the formula for the endpoint amp amplitude that I gave you. And we're gonna do this um, for the case of two point amplitudes on backgrounds, where the non-trivial piece here uh, is what we will focus on. So this is the leading, leading order in the coupling. Okay, so now we do this, we compute two point amplitudes on these backgrounds, and then once we have the two-point amplitude, we do this Mellon transform of, of all the external particles here um, to get the corresponding celestial correlation function and then try to interpret what it means. So here are the features of the result. On all these backgrounds, we find that the correlation function, the celestial correlation function, has a power law behavior in the, co in the uh, celestial coordinates. So this is no longer confined to this delta function support that the flat space amplitudes had, which is good. And secretly, um, it comes from the fact that we're breaking some isometry. Um, another feature of this uh, correlation functions on backgrounds is that the classical spin seems to um, serve an intriguing role of a UV uh, regulator. So I told you in the beginning that because we're integrating all, all the energies, um, celestial amplitudes don't have to be well-defined and aren't in general. What happens if you have a background that has classical spin, such as the curved black hole, or uh, a spinning sort of shock wave that's called a gyroton, is that it takes this delta function support and smears it over the sphere. So technically what happens is that in this Mellon integral, one power of the energy gets replaced by a Hunkel function, and that has finite support. So this leaves interesting questions about what that means, finitized effect coming from spin and so on. Okay, so there is one background that has particularly nice features that I wanna focus in the um, sort of last bit, which are shock waves. So 
shock waves, we have understood that they actually transform as uh, conformal primaries. And here I'm focusing on uh, four space-time dimensions, so two uh, CFT dimensions. So um, they take the, the, this form here, so this is a scalar shock wave, um, which is given by a logarithm of the space-time coordinate squared and has delta function support. And you can show that this transforms uh, as a conformal primary with a specific uh, conformal dimension and spin given by one and zero. Now you can build from the scalar shock wave via this so-called Kerr shield double copy um, shock waves with spin um, by multiplying it by a Kerr shield vector, which is this vector Q here. Um, and in this way, in particular, obtain a metric primary with specific conformal dimensions, which uh, you can uh, show uh, if you compute the full metric by adding this piece to the flat metric, it corresponds exactly to the Eiffelbox axle shock wave metric. So these transform as conformal primaries. And we can now compute, um, do, do this exercise again of computing a scalar two-point function on this shockwave backgrounds. So the nice property that I have is that two-point functions on shockwave backgrounds, we can interpret them as three-point functions in the CFD because the shockwave itself can be generated by a conformal primary. So for the case of an electromagnetic shockwave, this lands us on the nose on the right expression and uh, we can see here that this is, uh, takes the form of a standard CFD2 um, three-point correlator as far as the coordinate dependence is concerned. So that's nice. For gravity, you have to work a little harder. And in particular, to bring it into the form of a normal-looking three-point correlation function, what you have to do is you have to take the conformal dimensions of the scalars that you scatter and take it uh, off the principal series. Principal series, remember, in in, in two dimensions would now be given by one plus an imaginary number. And now we have to restrict the sum of the two, not to two plus an imaginary number, um, but uh, to one. But if you do that, you find that scattering scalars on a gravitational shock wave background um, also takes the form of a nice three-point correlation function. So the last thing that I want to talk about uh, is uh, the Angel action. So I've told you that we can obtain correlation functions in celestial conformal field theory by solving the classical equations of motions in the presence of a source and then taking functional derivatives with respect to the source. In ads the generating functional is given by the on shell action, which localizes on the boundary. So do we get this here too? So that's what we went to check. So um, you can write the action um, as, uh, you can massage it into a form so that it's given by the equations of motion, which vanish on shell, and the boundary term. And the natural boundary term in asymptotic a flat space is the null boundary here. So squi minus, union squi plus. Now we want to check whether the on shell action generates correlation functions for the case of a complex massless scalar, minimally coupled to gravity as before. Um, so what we have is we have the equations of motions, which um, I can put in this form that we have a piece that looks like the free wave equation, and then we bunch all the other terms um, together in this effective source. Um, then uh, we put as an incoming wave a plane wave, and then compute the outgoing wave um, by our usual Green's function approach. And then we plug it in, and we compute uh, this boundary action at large radius, um, keeping the null coordinates here, so the advanced coordinate and the past boundary and the retarded coordinate on the future boundary fixed. And then what happens is that there is a saddle point approximation that we can do, and this boundary on shell action localizes. It localizes on the boundary um, to the Fourier transform of the effective source uh, evaluated along the incoming momentum. Okay, so that's nice. So we have some factorization, uh, not factorization, some localization at the boundary. And now um, let's put it together with what I've told you before about this Boulware-Brown method uh, and see if it's the generating functional of correlation functions. So this is what I told you before. Two-point amplitude uh, is given in terms of the classical solution to the equations of motion. Um, if you follow this Boulware-Brown procedure, um, you find that the leading um, solution is given by the Fourier transform of the effective source in this relation here. Plug it in. And then we use the result that I have just told you, which is that the Fourier transform of the effective source um, corresponds to the boundary on shell action. Plug that in, and then you see that indeed the boundary on shell action in asymptotic flat space is the generating functional for correlation functions. Okay? So now uh, I think I'm 
out of time, so let me finish with some open questions. So I've told you about symmetries and how we can classify all the soft symmetries by making use of uh, QFT and uh, CFT techniques, and that uh, symmetries um, become very manifest in this, in this boost basis. Um, some questions are, are there more symmetries that we have missed here? What happens at the quantum level? Um, do all the soft symmetries have an interpretation as asymptotic symmetries? That's an open question. Um, then I've told you that this shadow transform plays a very prominent role, um, while in usual CFT it's just a tool. So what's the meaning of this? And can we understand it from a bulk perspective? Um, then more broader questions uh, are, identifying the symmetries is only a first step in sort of building a bottom-up um, celestial dictionary. Um, what are the axioms that govern this celestial conformal field theory? Can we do a bootstrap? Um, are there interesting constraints that we can get by imposing sort of normal CFT properties at the boundary? Does this imply anything interesting for effective field theory in the bulk? Then I've uh, sort of told you that we are taking steps towards trying to understand black holes uh, in celestial CFT. Um, in the beginning, I've mentioned that there is an anti wissonian paradigm that's going on for these celestial amplitudes, and you might think that that's a bug, but maybe that's actually a feature because what if there are new UV complete uh, theories that we haven't thought of yet um, and can um, demanding the well-behavedness of celestial amplitudes tell us anything about that? Uh, and, and then finally, um, does this sort of, can we enlarge the swampland by uh, making demands on properties of celestial amplitudes? And I think I'm out of time, so let me just uh, end on a sort of provocative note, um, which is a conjecture. Um, which, if you want to test that conjecture, you should come and talk to me. Thanks. Thanks, Andrea. So, time for questions. So I had a question about uh, this open problem of, about the shadow transform. So you gave me the impression that in four dimensions, oh, well, in two dimensions, this also already occurred? Yes. And do you have an understanding there? So Why? In, in two dimensions, so in two dimensions, you landed already on the current, but that's because, the sh so the current has dimension one, and the shadow of dimension one in two dimensions is two minus one, so it's again one. So whether you land on the current or its shadow, it gives you the same sort of symmetry. So that's why for the current, you, you didn't have to do that. Um, for, um, so that was the leading soft photon theorem. For the leading soft graviton theorem, you actually got something that is not something that's usually uh, considered in CFD, which is this weight shifting operator. So there you maybe didn't notice that there's a shadow that you might take. But then for the subleadings of graviton, um, since you didn't land on a stress tensor, there, there you had to do it. So in two dimensions, it's very similar to higher dimensions, but in two dimensions, there's some sort of degeneracy because of the, the, the well, because one, two minus one is one. So there you didn't uh, see on the nose that you had to deal with shadows. But th this is a general feature that the, the symmetries manifest themselves. The ones that you have in normal CFDs come about when you do the shadow transform. And from a bulk perspective, in, in any dimensions, whether it's in 4.2 or in D plus 2D, um, we don't have a sort of bulk motivation for why you would have to do that. So yeah. uh, maybe just to follow up quickly. Um, so now you mentioned the leading and the subleading. What about the sub-subleading? Yeah, this? so the sub-subleading, um, as far as I know, so it has some conservation equation that's higher order. So it's, in, in let's say, in two dimensions, the uh, subleadings of photon has two derivatives, and the sub subleadings of graviton has four. So those also have water identities, but I don't think that they have, I mean, they're not familiar operators considered in CFT as far as I know, um, but they have conservation equations. And you can, you also uh, can apply the shadow transform to get, uh, so in two dimensions, both types, the ones that you land on the nose from the soft theorem, the shadow ones are of the same, have the same type of con conservation equation in the sense that they are given by the same types of primary descendant operators. In higher dimensions, that is no longer the case, and so that's why in higher dimensions you really need the shadow to actually get something non-trivial. Okay, thank you. I'm curious about the shockwaves you described. So shockwaves normally as a, as a direction in some kind of retarded time. Where's the retarded time encoded? We have and integrated over it. 
Ah, I see. So it's yeah. transition so environment. There are, th there are three bases that we usually use in all this business. One is the position basis, where you usually describe memory facts. The, then the energy basis, where you usually do quantum field theory amplitudes and so on. And then here the boost basis, and they're all related to integrating over the other. So they're dual variables. So uh -huh. we have integrated over u or over omega. Does it make yeah. sense for you to have more than one shock waves and somehow scatter them? Um, why not? Okay. Yeah. Um, it's a more difficult computation. We have, we've, yeah. Here we've limited ourselves to computing two point functions on one shock wave background, but uh, yeah, it's an inter interesting question to. I mean, there are lots of interesting questions related to shock waves, and in particular, if you add black holes to the picture. Um, so, yeah, those are questions for future work. Okay. Yeah. So, I have a question about uh, comparing the fourth wave time dimensions with higher dimensions. What we've been doing. So, as you know, in four dimensions, it's scattering up because the other ones are stronger groups, they are spread diversion. So, do you see a clear signal or some high signature in the population between four and higher dimensions? Um, so, I mean, soft terms exist in any dimensions. But, um, and the asymptotic symmetries have also been proposed for any dimensions, but only in four dimensions do you really need them to, like in this Fadiev Kulish type of dressings to render the S matrix finite. Um, if you're asking me whether from this perspective, okay, so from, yeah, good. From the perspective of um, the, the symmetries in celestial CFD um, is, if you look at all the soft terms, you get what you expect from uh, usual CFT, namely that you get the global symmetries. So in two dimensions, the special thing was to get, that you also get this local enhancement to all the symmetries that have, on the bulk point of view, have been proposed as, you know, the asymptotic symmetry group. Um, so you might take this as a hint that, okay, the symmetries that give you, um, uh, that cure the infrared divergences in four dimensions, um, there is no such enhancement in high dimensions where you don't need that. So you might take this as a hint. I'm not sure I would, would go that far as really taking that as a, uh, as a hint, because even in, in two dimensions, um, if you define a symmetry as uh, you take the charge and you take the region to include all the insertions, if you define the symmetry to be that being zero, um, then also the local symmetries are not symmetries in that sense. Um, and in high dimensions, it's just that we don't have, you know, D, D by DZ bar on one over Z is, is a delta function in 2D, but in higher D we don't have that same thing, and so we don't have this, this enhancement. Um, so from the point of symmetries, you might take this as a hint, but uh, I'm not sure it's a good reason to say that. Um, yeah. I was just curious if you can elaborate a bit what you mean with the anti wilsonian So I think I got that the point is that the amplitude is only well defined if you have the full UV theory and not just the low energy spectrum, yeah. right? but how you explicitly, I don't know, how you see this explicitly? What so if mean? you compute uh, an amplitude directly, let's say we take the endpoint graviton amplitude in Einstein gravity, you see that when you take this integral transform, um, that the integral is just divergent. So these amplitudes are classically not well defined. Uh, in the case of young mills theory, something special happens because of scale symmetry in four dimensions, and the amplitude, this energy integral can be interpreted as a distribution. So there you can say, okay, this, this kind of makes sense and you have a well-defined celestial amplitude. Um, but in, I guess in most theories, this will not be the case. Um, a counterexample is when you look at these amplitudes in string theory, because of the soft UV behavior, this integral becomes you know, finite. So one question is, can you take as an axiom that you, your theory, whatever you think that uh, you know, you have some effective field theory that you think maybe has a good UV completion, uh, or you want to test whether it has that, can you take as an axiom that it should have well-defined celestial amplitude? So, yeah. Yeah, I have a question, nice question. Is it possible to view the celestial amplitude as a flat, flat base limit of uh, not observable in a DS? Sorry, say that again? Is it possible to view the uh, celestial amplitude as a flat space limit of some observable in ADS? Uh, in the same way as uh, flat space amplitude is the flat space limit as an ADS. Of uh, the amplitude in ADS. in ADS, yes. Yeah, I mean, what we're doing is we're 
start with a flat space amplitude and then we change basis and that's the celestial amplitude. Yeah, but in EDS we can have the mill amplitude mm -hmm. and then take the flat space limit. Mm -hmm. Do we have something similar in EDS? So you're asking about the melon amplitude in ADS, which in, is stripping off some... I mean, in ADS we, have, we can define the mill amplitude and take the flat space limit and then we have the scattering amplitude in momentum space. Mm -hmm. And do we have something similar in ADS? for which we did the flat space limit and we obtain directly the set of ah, you mean, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, so that's an interesting question indeed. So what you will have to figure out there is there's a dimension that uh, gets lost. Yeah. So <laughs> that's, uh, that's the task that you have to figure out. So you, you say you have a, a, D plus, well, a D plus three dimension, well, D plus two dimensional bulk, a D plus one dimensional CFD dual to that, so that ADS bulk, uh, and that should somehow reduce upon the flat space limit to uh, a CFT correlator in one dimension less. Yeah. So that's the task to figure out. I think there has been some um, recent work um, by Raclarion collaborators that tries to address this question in the Icona limit. Um, but in, in general, this is an open question. This is super interesting. I've thought a bit about it, but um, it seems a hard thing to do. Thank you. But that's super interesting, yeah. Can I ask you about this correspondence between the soft theorems and the primary descendants? Mm -hmm. Is it one-to-one? Uh, -one? Is the statement that for all non-soft theorems we have primary descendants, and for every known primary descendant in the paper of Joao and friends, we have a soft theorem? Yeah, so uh, Joao and Emilio and uh, Saki, they classified when uh, a primary that has a descendant, sorry, when the descendant of a primary becomes a primary, in general CFD, and then um, we, what you have is a condition on the conformal dimensions. So there's a conformal dimension that relates the degree of conservedness and the spin. And then what we have is the soft theorem tells you the delta, the conformal dimension. And then starting from that, you can see when this, this special operator has a primary descendant. So, and then so this has more. We specify the delta of the parent primary from the soft theorem, and then we get some number of uh, primary sentence. Okay. So that's what the question th that I had is, are there more symmetries that could come from, I don't know, somewhere? Um, the ones that I discussed are the ones that come from soft theorems, which tell you, okay, here is an operator with that conformal dimension and spin, and now s see how it is conserved. And in all the cases that, uh, that we discussed here, you have this operator and it has some word identity. Uh, and in some cases, this what identity has the interpretation of a space-time asymptotic symmetry, and in others it's more obscured. But from the CFT perspective, it's kind of clear what, what you do. You get a conservation equation, and then you can construct um, another current and charges. Yeah. Thanks. I don't see any other questions, so let's thank Andrea again.